for really detailed and mind-raging speech. Um, we're going to open the floor to questions. Yeah. Oh, well, obviously, everything I say happens with complete certainty. So I've, I've no idea. Like, it is just if the ECB do it, it does depend on what is the exact exposure of the SMEs. Like, say, how many of the heavily indebted ones, how, what share of employment they account for. And those things we, we simply don't know. Like, we know more about the medieval English economy than we do about Irish SMEs. I'm serious. Like they're just, as far as economists are concerned, like not only academic economists, but central bank everywhere, they are just so boring. No one is interested in them. But they are, for better or worse, they are the Irish economy. Um, what's the implication of uh, the ECB and Mario Draghi having such massive in, uh, uh, control over the, the, um, like the functioning of member state economies? Like, it seems like someone who isn't elected um, and the ECB is impossible to change unless you have a treaty change and all that kind of stuff. Has a massive amount of influence over what goes on inside member economies. Well, that is the nature of central banks, and that they are largely independent of political pressure. And you, it's actually a very good thing to the extent that he is doing the opposite of what the Germans want, and that he has, seems to be building up a coalition to enable him to undertake large quantitative easing. So he is doing their right thing right now. Like you say, Trichet had the same powers. He was doing their wrong thing. It, it, it is the, the nature of central banking, particularly in a strange political system like the European Union. So obviously you have the same thing going on that obviously you have Germany is running the place effectively, but we don't vote for Angela Merkel, but she effectively just gets to decide a lot of what happens to us. It, it, it is problematic, yeah? Yeah, so guys in the back row, yeah. Um, uh, Morgan, do you think it matters economically what politicians you elect in Ireland anymore, given that maybe our monetary policies have gone from Frankfurt and now with the uh, fiscal treaty, we've lost so much control of our fiscal policy. I mean, even if a, a government were elected with a mandate to bring back the economic change, would they be able to do it? Uh, probably not, no. I think at this stage, like our policy does largely consist in getting the Germans to like us, to say we're good kids. But basically all of these things are determined largely by these political narratives in Germany. Like you have the situation in Cyprus there, the story there, they told themselves, oh look, these guys are, you know, help, are just money launderers. We can wipe them out. And they go and they do that. And then a few months later, you guys probably didn't notice, they, a report comes out from the ECB and says, oh look, in terms of money laundering, Cyprus's regulations were actually pretty good and well enforced. So like you just have this casual mendacity going on, okay? But there's nothing, we just have to learn to live with it. Like we are a small fish there, yeah. So we basically just have to get these guys to pat us on the head and treat us nicely. And that's, that, that, that is the harsh reality of our situation, yeah? Yeah, yes. so the guy beside you, yeah. yeah so can we take you back to 2000, 2003 when we had the... I was hardly born then. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly most of the people in the room weren't, yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the amounts involved are going to be smaller. Like the last time I did a back of envelope calculation, like back when the bailouts were occurring, I reckoned in total it would cost about 90 billion. Yeah, for, for the developer loans and everything. And my figure for the developer loans was pretty correct. It was sort of laughed at at the time. But, so I would reckon maybe something of the order of 25, 30 billion. And so this is, say, on top of then our 
120% of GDP national debt, which right now is a sort of a joke. It doesn't bind anymore. Same way banks don't need capital. We don't need solvency, okay, for now. Okay, but this could come back to bite us in the ass at some stage, okay, if you have this endless accommodation. If, if that ends, we are, even without this extra stuff, we are facing a very big national debt, okay? But what I'm pointing out to you is that in addition to this, like everybody's going, oh, the bank side of it, oh yes, the, the bank's going to cost us money. But the problem is that the people who owe the money to these banks are, these SMEs, are basically a big fraction of the Irish economy. And so th there's a lot to be worried about on both sides. Yeah? Uh, sorry, just a question about the, the debt being 100% of GDP. Um, we still have a really large deficit, so the debt has grown each year. And uh, it's questionable if we're going to be getting significant economic growth anytime soon. So I just wonder, how is this situation going to eventually resolve itself or not? I don't know. That is a good question. Nobody knows, nobody particularly cares. The hope is, in the long run, that a lot of this debt is owed to agencies, okay, to the ECB and so on. It's a lot easier to reach agreements on these sort of things than it is on your regular sovereign debt, okay? And so like you've got, say, a country like Britain, no, which has never defaulted on its debt since our 1690s and so on. They defaulted on inter-allied war loans to the US, like basically from the First World War, they kept stringing them out and so on. And there are endless renegotiations. So once you owe money to other governments, there is a lot of wiggle room and that we may be able to exploit in the future. But right now our problems are sort of, I think, a bit more pressing though. Yeah? Or, I mean, just in relation to that last point, I can't help feeling that you know, the situation, situation isn't completely beyond our individual control. And I always like to, <coughs> to think of how we ourselves can influence the matter. And I, 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 I was, I've always struggled with the situation in Ireland because if we take, for example, the cuts, the recent cuts in the public sector, there's <coughs> absolutely no, uh, uh, there, there's no one there speaking on behalf of, of, of people in the public sector in terms of what's happened. There's, there's absolutely no opposition. If those cuts, for example, had been in somewhere like Italy or even, even the UK or whatever, there would, there would have been widespread opposition. So I think it's, there's something in, uh, possibly in the nature of the Irish psyche in terms of acquiescence. Why the hell do we not you know, make the politicians stand up and, and think about, you know, what the consequences are of this. We're, we're all complacent. Well, no, I don't think it's that. I think it is realism on people, on the part of people, that our politicians have no say in it. Like, we can elect any government we want, as long as they do exactly these things. So it's basically, we are engaged in a sort of a theatre right now, show, oh, look, we are responsible, we, we have mended our ways, and be nice to us. And that's, that, that's where that and Irish people realise well, that. I'm, I'm, I'm not as fatalistic as you in relation yeah. to that. Oh, well, I do think okay. we, we, we must burden some of this ourselves and do something about it and really start thinking about it being more active about Yeah, no, I, I'd say I, I, I would be more fatalistic than you are, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah? Um, does that mean that austerity hasn't worked? It's just been uh, kept afloat by this endless line of credit from Europe? In terms of getting the economy back on the road? Well, it, it's essentially, no, it has, it's basically we have had credit, okay? That's nothing to do with us. We haven't had the sort of credit contraction you would have expected. And certainly, austerity, say, has been useful in the sense that they are stringing us out, they are lending the Irish government money, and that's, that's essentially what it's all about. It is just part of this sort of theatrical performance we are putting on. That, like you have to remember, like ultimately, I think Colin McCarthy sort of got into a lot of trouble for this. But he's right that German notions of economics are radically different than Anglo-Saxon ones. Like for us, economics is has nothing to do with morality. In Germany, historically, economics has been very tied up with ethics and with law, and it still is. So, as far as Germans are concerned, this is all a morality play. And so you've got these bad Mediterraneans. And you've got then these sort of good Irish, and that's so essentially you, we're, we're going along with this sort of play. And it's sort of a bit alien to our, like, we think of economics as an amoral sort of thing. But yeah, it, it is, it, it is theatre we're engaged in, a sort of political theatre, yeah? So would it really matter if there were less cuts and more cuts? Oh no, it's important that you do 
have these cuts to show that you're you no know, serious about it and bringing your and living within your means and all these burger lick sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, what hope do you have for the future in terms of institutions and politicians? Oh Lord. Um, <laughs> Very few. Um, what you have is, in Ireland, you've traditionally had two sorts of values which have sort of conflicted with each other, even when they've been the same person. On the one hand, you have had Fianna Fáil, okay? Like, you're all old enough to remember Fianna Fáil. Okay. And actually, one interesting thing that I didn't really mention about the university is the university is where one institution on our site that was not infiltrated by Fianna Fáil. The only other one was the Catholic Church, which, again, most of you probably aren't old enough to remember. But, <laughs> okay, but what happened, Fianna Fáil had this, when it came to power in the 1930s, had this outsider mentality. Okay, it was representing those you know, small farmers and industrial workers against strong farmers. So the idea was you go in, you take everything you can get. This stuff belongs to the elite. It's your duty to look after yourself. And what was interesting is that this view survived right up until 2008. So that you had during the crisis, Biffo stood up at one stage and blamed the crisis on elites. Saying, no, these elites have caused this crisis. Okay, so they maintained this view of outsiders. So when you get in something, you look after yourself. There is no such thing as duty, there are only entitlements. This was kept in check by Catholicism. Irish Catholicism had, I think, almost nothing to recommend it, except one thing. It imbued its believers with a sense of duty. And this sort of counterbalanced this sort of gorge yourself at the trough mentality. And this sort of conservative Catholicism lives on in strange places. Like you can see it, say, in the upper levels of the Irish judiciary. You've seen when the commercial court, these Various developers have been sliced up by judges. But it's very much dying out, okay? It's, I think, the one sort of negative thing about the collapse of Catholicism, which leaves us with very, very little by way of any sort of public morality in this society. I, Ireland is unusual in that you've always had this big exit from it. And, like, there's one economist who studied failing institutions, a guy called Hirschman, who died quite recently. And his most famous book is called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. He was kind of, how do people respond to failure in institutions? And he said, OK, there's loyalty, which he didn't really look at. He said, there's either exit or voice. OK, voice is a sort of political response. You go and you complain about things, and you discuss things, and you make them better. Exit is what happens usually in a market. People leave. No, you go to a different firm. And Hirschman in passing asked, well, what happens in a society if you have exit, if people who aren't happy leave? And this has always been the case in Ireland. And what he pointed out was you end up with the tyranny of the weak by the incompetent. <laughs> and that is as succinct a definition of Irish society as you will ever come across. Okay, you have a very small pool of talent, okay, not just in the football team, but also in the central bank, in government, everywhere. And these people then, the stronger ones, lord it over the weak. And so I would not be very optimistic about future standards in Irish society. Say we've learned nothing from this. I say like just the most basic thing that you thought you would have learned is the need for transparency. Okay, anything that happens to do with bank finances is in the open, but the whole mortgage thing shows that's not happening. We just haven't learned anything. Yep. Just on the mortgage thing, in the Irish Times in November, it was on um, defaulters, and what you said was that um, individuals defaulting 
for the same as price for two hundred thousand is wanting to be a political Do you still feel that way? Yeah, the whole political thing has been very strange. Like when this thing was kicking off, I thought, okay, this could have big, a big political impact. And like just the combination of, yeah, unemployment, people been boosted out of their houses. And okay, that hasn't happened so much, but still there has been very little political change. Like at the time, I sort of feared that you would see some sort of, no, hard right sort of anti-euro, anti-traveller party emerge. But it hasn't. And I don't think, if, if it was going to emerge, I think it would have happened by now. And I think there are a variety of things going on. I think partially, say, the crisis hasn't hit as badly as it might and still could do. Partially, the fact is that Irish people are a lot better educated than they used to be. But I think a big factor is, again, lack of talent that they're simply, in terms of sort of Hitler wannabes, we're as short of those as we are decent football players. That there just, thankfully, is not such a person out there capable of galvanizing such a party. And so politicians we've got, like, they're sure of incompetent and sort of crooked, but they're not scary. And so it's, it's probably a positive <laughs> thing on balance, yeah. Yeah? It's a matter of being pragmatic about it. The point is, there are obviously always problems in any negotiation if you start going soft on people. But you do have good information, okay? That you do have full information on this person's finances, on what they can afford to pay. And you can so put in caveats saying, well, look, if in the future a house rises in value, then the state becomes a part owner of it and so on to try and get back some of it. But in practice, it does seem to be a, if you are serious about getting money back, like rather than the situation saying, oh, look, we're going, what you've got now is people have been given deals by banks and it seems to last a few months and then they go again. Like it's the only way of making sense, you've got these very strange default days, like you no know, length of time you've been in default, they jump all over the place. And that's what seems to be happening. So basically banks will give you any sort of deal you want. People can, like you, think, oh look, you can stay in your house, but you're gonna to have to eat dog food for the rest of your life. People say grand, but obviously after a few months, <laughs> after a few months they start having second thoughts and they, they fall behind on the payments again and it all begins. So in practice, the only thing is, but again, you need to have transparent rules and say, okay, like if you owe more than a given multiple of your income, you're going to have to leave the house, okay? If you're within a certain range, we will reduce it by 20% and so on. So I think you can get around it. And th the point is you're not going to get all the money back. The idea is trying to get as much back as possible. But right now we've just got this situation where you just endlessly defer things. And it doesn't matter to banks. They don't need any capital anymore. They're not concerned with rebuilding themselves. So what's the problem? But it is, in, from US experience, it is the only thing that does work, yeah. Sorry, yeah, questions back? Uh, how would you go about looking at the second level and third level education? What would you recommend to improve the standard and quality of the students coming out of it? Well, you just need to start at the second level. You start need to making demands of kids again. You need to start raising standards, forcing them, like rather than just, no memorising these rote answers. You need to get them to start thinking again. You need to start making the maths curriculum harder again. In terms of universities, again, we need to raise our standards, okay? There's been this sort of teaching and learning mafia within the university saying, oh, you can't fail students. We do need to start failing people again, frightening them. A big problem in UCD has been this whole Bologna process, okay? that what happened, or baloney in American. Basically, the idea is that in order to get a European accreditation for your degree, you have to teach a certain number of hours, okay? And the difficulty you face is that in Europe, you have four, five, six, ten year undergraduate degrees. Here we've got three. So we have to force huge numbers of classes onto you people. With the result, people aren't showing up at class. They're not learning the stuff. It's been a disaster. But ultimately, say, you do need to have more academics in the place. You need to be promoting decent. Like there was a promotion round recently where they just promoted people who were involved with this teaching and learning mafia, people who were involved in administration. You've got extraordinarily good researchers who are turned down 
for like, people who had chairs and other places were turned down. You need to start promoting decent people within the place. Say you need fewer administrators, more academics. Just simple things. It, it isn't going to happen. Like essentially, the universities now are basically the way the HSE is, the health service executive. Like the, we're not there now to provide education any more than they're there to provide health. We're there to provide BMWs or preferably Range Rovers to senior administrators. And that's like what the business is at. It's like basically, the big breakthrough for Irish universities, as far as administrators are concerned, will be student loans. Like this is how the US, administrating the US achieved nirvana. That you can then you can pump up the fees. You have kids coming in who are like, as, as you guys coming into places that you're sort of not as naive as you're sort of sitting on Santa's lap, sort of telling him what you want for Christmas. And you pay up all this money. And at the end, then you have this huge debts. You've learned nothing worthwhile. But administrators, <laughs> boy, can they look after themselves. So that, that is really the way to go for the Irish universities. Yeah? You mentioned that um, German um, economics has more, morality, has more morality in it. And a lot of what you're saying here is suggests that there's a lot of people in our system who are behaving immorally and that the system seems to perpetuate that immorality. Is there, is there room to think about the way we do teach economics, and is there room for more morality in our own economics? Oh, uh, that's, yeah, that, that's an interesting sort of question. Yeah, there, there probably is, yeah. The simple answer is yes. But the hard answer would take me days and days to think of. So I thought that is a very interesting question, but you're probably right on balance, yeah. But I, yeah, I've never given that consideration, yeah. Yeah? Um, it's not that like a silly question, but what would or would happen if the Irish government or the Irish people refused to meet the requirements set by the European Union? Oh, goodness. Like, you could have like, credit to the banks cut off. And like essentially, you would have your savings in the Irish banks. There would be nothing backing them. Like that, that would be the most immediate direct thing, essentially de facto expulsion from the Eurozone. And so that, that would not be pleasant. Why? Uh, basically, because there would be nothing backing up if you have anything in a bank. Like it's, you, you, would, you would not have it there anymore. Like your banking system would collapse. Like your economy would not function. But it strikes me that the real best way to get rid of our debt is to inflate it away. What would have happened in the past? Oh, sure. And that is, I think, what Draghi would like to do. Like what everybody, bar the Germans, agrees that what the Eurozone needs is a sort of a dose of moderate inflation, like no 3 4% for a decade or so. Yeah. And he, it would seem he is trying to work his way around to that against German opposition. And obviously, the real ideal outcome would be if the Germans decided, OK, we will leave the Eurozone. Like, just this is inflationary and goes against all our values. And then, like, there would be a big depreciation of the euro for all the guys left. And that, that would sort out a lot of problems. There's no question about it. But <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, the in, inflation w would sort out a huge number of problems. Yeah? yeah? And the implications on Ireland of the um, yes and no. If it, it is a real possibility, okay, it's easier for them to leave than to renegotiate. Should they leave, nothing will happen. Okay? That basically there will be no trade sanctions against Britain and it will just be business as usual. Okay? They may decide to you know, put up barriers against some inferior races or whatever the Conservative Party is about. But that would be the beginning and end of the process. So there would still be free trade, more or less free mobility, free flow of capital. In other words, nothing would happen. And you might see then others deciding to head for the exits as well. It, it could lead to a disintegration of the whole thing, yeah. That like if they do it and the skies don't darken and everything doesn't collapse, then they, they set a precedent and other people could, could leave as well, yeah. Ah, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> like basically, it could be just when we left. The last time anybody left the UK was when we left. And the way that we managed it was we maintained a link with Sterling without any official link existing. Okay? There was no fixed exchange rate. We had effectively a currency board. And, but um, it, it, it ain't going to happen at this stage. It's going to get beaten. So, Yeah, at the back. Sorry. If the um, banks have gone under uh, back in 2008, obviously they've been in a much uh, worse position 
initially, would you think that instead of kicking the can down the road, that we would have we've been able to get back on track sooner, rather than as it, keep them, keep it going and being on the threat of um, uh, something worse happening in the future? Oh yeah, I think it would have been possible, like had we been very tough, we could have inflicted the losses on the bondholders. Like you could have, like they've done in Cyprus, the, you make these guys the shareholders in the banks. That could have been done if we had been utterly different than we are, but it, it didn't happen. It, it, it's irrelevant at, at this stage. Yeah? Uh, yeah, um, I want to ask you, so in the UK currently, in regards to small in economic Oh God, <laughs> keep, keep coming back to your question, I can't answer. Okay, you found my weak point, okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, certainly getting away just from the morality issue is simply in terms of macroeconomics. It's astonishing how little the profession has learned from the crash. That basically economists still continue to use these what are called DSGE models, which are essentially like dynamic stochastic general equilibrium. It's basically you're sort of in an economy on your own growing corn, and they're occasional, the weather is good or bad. And that's how the macro economy is still viewed. So just the idea of you no know, credit screw ups, banks doing horrible things, none of this enters into conventional macro models. Almost none of it. So certainly there does need to be a very serious rethink, I think of macroeconomics, okay, just at a technical level, as opposed to like wider issues of morality, which, which also do need to be looked at, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, sorry, just a question about like the whole concept of the whole knowledge-based economy, I'll, I'll probably refer specifically to things like science and engineering, because uh, that's what the governments are really, really seem to push, like, you know, students don't need to start to do, but, uh, like, uh, like over the last number of years, like me, for example, during the building boom, it was all about building houses that are at the heart and traded internationally. And uh, like a lot of people would probably be better off going into an area with just with a strong union backing you or a professional body backing your interests or, uh, or going into finance, which in a lot of ways is probably a non productive industry, like you know, in a lot of ways. So it's just that um, I suppose the question is like, um, like the government keeps pushing people into degrees that are very productive by their nature, like you know, like, like science and engineering, where that really create things. But uh, like, is but is there that much actual productivity actually taking place in the economy? Sure, just people obviously just do things. I think will get them jobs. I think that's that's ultimately and that's sort of a naive economist view of it. I, I'm not sure that's a yeah. Okay, any yeah. Do you think that there's been enough I don't know. I certainly wouldn't be interested. So yeah, I think there's been <laughs> plenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there was a rather than a direct cleanup by Irish banks, if there was an overall tightening of credit, would the effects more or less be the same or similar? Um. Yeah. Pre well. Basically, you do have all these bad loans, like any tightening of credit has to deal with those. So you have to get those off the bank balance sheet somehow. And yeah, tightening up in general, you, you would expect that to happen at the same, like in, in any normal circumstances, it would have happened. Yeah, that you still have these banks with massive balance sheets relative to the size of the economy. So in the longer run, if like, no, the Eurozone ever recovers, that there will have to be a big contraction in credit in this place, yeah. Just maybe just one more question. Ah, there's not. Okay, <laughs> we finish up. Okay, so thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>